again and again because Okay, so what we're going to do is we're continue. We're going to finish out chapter nine today, and then we're going to start on chapter ten, which is radicals. Okay, so uh, we do have a group activity. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out an email tomorrow. I'm going to have you actually do it well, um, and not as a group activity because I need that time for a thing. It'll still count for a grade for group activity, but it's not due until the Monday we have our exam. So, and what it is, is it's a reaction table. It actually is going to be a study aid for you and this exam and for everything we've done up to now. And so it's going to be a study aid for the final. And you can use it next semester to remember all these reactions when your professor says, don't you remember that reaction? And you can say, I have it written down somewhere. I'm going to go look it up. So that's what we're going to do for that. And I'll send that email out tomorrow, including uh, blank pages uh, that I have that I'm going to fill in a couple examples of how you can fill this out. And then I want you to fill out the rest of it, take a picture of it, upload it to Canvas, okay? So just to look at it as a way to kind of get it straight in your head, all the different reactions we've done. We've actually done a lot of reactions uh, and that some of them are stereo specific, some of them are regio specific, some of them are, uh, you know, um, have to have a certain requirement like a catalyst, some of them don't. So things that you'll have to, those are things that you'll be putting down on that list. Okay, but back to our um, uh -oh. NMR. Okay, so we started talking about the four most important things in NMR, and that is the number of peaks you have, and that's the number of unique hydrogens you have. Okay, then you talked about the intensity, which is the type of intensity on each one. Hang on, I'm gonna pause for a second here. Uh, Zoom recording. All right, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, did that answer the question about five? Okay, yeah, all right. So when you have an electron or drawing group on a benzene system though, you actually, the, the peaks can actually be shifted very far apart. So these are next to this electronegative atom and are shifted further uh, downfield. And so there's actually a peak to peak separation here. We almost get that here, but we really see it in that uh, more electronegative atom attached to benzene. So that's with one substitution, you get this kind of pattern with the five hydrogens not being identical anymore. If you have two substitutions, you actually get a very classical pattern and it's, and it's a doublet of doublets. Okay, because in the case of you have two substituents, even if they're the same substituent, they typically give this pattern because this pair of hydrogens is now different than that pair of hydrogens. So the pairs split each other, but they're also separated apart. So we see this two sets of doublets. And so whenever you see that on an MR, you should start thinking it's a one four substitution. So this is the one position, that's the four position. So it's one, two, three, four, all the way around. So anytime you have one, four, you get this doublet of doublets. Okay, that's a classical benzene pattern. Oh, and here's another classic pattern for an ethyl group right here. You have three peaks and four peaks. That's gonna be your classical pattern for the two hydrogens here and the three hydrogens here. So you can start to say, oh, a triplet and a quartet that's gonna be the quart the triplet's gonna be these because they're split by these two. The quartet's gonna be these because they're split by these three. And we get this classical pattern of the triplet quartet for an ethyl group. So a lot of NMR can be pattern recognition and looking at those splitting patterns we looked at on the previous page, plus looking at compounds that we've seen before. Now, I said for the one four substitution, we had this doublet of doublets. Well, there's a couple other ways to die substitute this. So this is one, two, three, four. And this is one, two, and this is one, two, three. So in our one four separation, we see this doublet of doublets because this set of hydrogens is different than that set of hydrogens and they split each other, okay? However, when we have this substitution here, this hydrogen is not the same as this hydrogen because they're next to different groups. 
And these two hydrogens are about the same. Oops, let me draw it in a different color. These two are about the same. And we end up getting this pattern of three peaks because of this is next to one group, this is next to the other group, and then these are about equal. So we end up with this pattern of three peaks. Okay. We see a similar thing happen when we have the one three because this peak right here is different than everything else because it's in between the two groups. We have, um, we have a, this group is different than that group because they're next to different things. And that leaves our last peak here completely different. Okay. However, these two are close enough together that they start to overlap each other. And the one that stands out so much more is the one that is uh, separate from or next to the most electronic drawing group, which is this one. So we see these classical patterns in the one, four, the one, two, and the one, three substitutions. Okay. Questions on proton NMR. The most important thing is that slide that shows you those four things you're looking for and the peak to peak splitting. Those are the, those are the two things that are going to be, uh, should be focused on most on those. Now, there's other kinds of nuclei that have an odd number of um, an odd atomic mass. When you have an odd atomic mass, you have an, uh, a, a mismatch between protons and neutrons and you are NMR active. You can have an unpaired set of spins and therefore you can see it, okay? So the next one we wanna talk about is an isotope of carbon. This isotope of carbon has 13 uh, molecular weight, uh, atomic weight, sorry. The most common isomer is carbon 12, six protons, six neutrons, but this one has an extra neutron in it. And so it has that odd set of uh, nuclear spins and therefore it is NMR active. However, carbon 13 is only about 1.1% of naturally occurring carbon. And therefore we can't get this high uh, definition of spin, uh, spin, spin splitting. And we also can't measure its intensity very evenly, okay? Because of this lack of having a lot of the carbon 13, we only care about two things now. We care about the number of peaks we have because the number of peaks we have tells us the different types of carbons. Remember, just like in, we did equivalent hydrogens, we have now the different equivalent carbons on this one. So we're gonna look for that. And then we care about the chemical shift. In proton NMR, we had about from zero to you know, 10 for most hydrocarbons and maybe up to 15 for something in the, uh, like a carboxylic acid. Carbon NMR is much wider, okay? We're gonna have from zero to about 220, okay? Those are our PPM numbers but the chemical shifts follow the same trend we saw in our um, proton NMR. The more electronegative atoms or the more uh, double bonds you have, the more you shift down until you get to a carbon oxygen double bond. That's the one that's gonna be shifted most up. We didn't see carbonyls in proton NMR because there was no hydrogens on them unless it was an aldehyde. Here we see carboxylic acids, carboxylic acid esters and aldehydes and ketones. And they're gonna be the shifted the most high, the most furthest up, starting at about 160, going all the way up to 210. Okay, so let's talk about the chemical shifts. So just like before, alkanes are the lowest set closest to zero, okay? And then as you add electronegative atoms to them, they get shifted up higher. So for example, with an oxygen on here, they're going to be shifted to 50 to 70 ppm instead of just up to the two to three ppm. With a halogen on there, it gets shifted all the way up to from 50 to 80 ppm. Okay. By the time you put an ester on here, you're shifting it up even higher where you have the um, 60 to 80 right here. The alkynal carbons are a little bit higher at 65 to 90. The alkenes are higher still. Remember the alkynal hydrogen was lower than the alkenal hydrogen as well. Let me switch out of yellow there. That's kind of hard to see. 
right here. The alkenes are higher at 110 to 140, but when we have resonance, it shifts even higher, 125 to 160. That's 160. And then the only thing above that are carbonyls. The carbonyls on esters, aldehydes, and ketones, and carboxylic acids are all between 160 and 210. So let's see how we can use this star advantage and look at uniqueness of carbons and shift, okay? So in the case of this structure here, I wanna show you why we have the different peaks we have, okay? So if we talk about this carbon here, right here, it's the only carbon with electronegative atom on it, right? So it's gonna be the highest shifted up field. And so that's gonna be our peak up here, okay? So now we have, oh, look, these two look to be the same, right? Well, no, they're unique because this one's next to a carbon with a chlorine on it, and this one's next to a carbon with just hydrogens on it. So that means these two peaks are different now. This methyl peak is not the same as this methyl peak because it's next to a carbon with a chlorine on it. So we have one, two, three, four, five peaks, and notice the one that's most like a hydrocarbon right here is the lowest down. Then the next most like a hydrocarbon, the next most like a hydrocarbon, one close to chlorine and the one actually bonded to chlorine. So we can see that shifting using that same general trend we saw in proton and MR to get us from one to the other. Okay, now let's look at unique carbons here now, okay? So right now we can say that they're all unique carbons because we have the, the a methyl group, a CH2, and then it's bonded to an oxygen. We have the carbonyl carbon. Can't forget the carbonyl carbon and carbon MR. And then a methyl group here. This methyl group is different than that methyl group because it's attached to the carbonyl, okay? But it's also most like the hydrocarbon. So we see the peak here and here for being these methyl peaks. The one bonded to the oxygen is the next one up, right at the 61, so it's higher than that. And our carbonyl peak is here at the 170. Remember, carbonyls start at 160 and go all the way up to 210. Okay. So we see that the, the basic trend is the same in their, where we expect to see them. And notice that even though it's drawn out to a wider range of PPMs, it's still in that generalized range. Now, there's also a very cool experiment we can do with carbon and MR. What we do is we actually take different segments of the pulse sequence, I mean, different segments of listening, and we can tell whether we have an odd number or an even number of hydrogens on it because the way they relax, okay? So in a normal carbon and MR, we would have, we could have this structure here, and we've identified where these peaks are, and you can go through them and figure out why B is so much higher than D, and why E and F are up here, because they're in the alkene. Okay. But when we do this experiment, all of the odd numbered hydrogens poke up. So the ones and threes will poke up, and all the ones that have twos and fours poke down. Okay, so that being said, we have this depth experiment showing us that we have this peak and this peak each have one hydrogen on them. These three peaks over here have three hydrogens on them. This is actually the peak we see for the carbon with no hydrogens on it. It's small, but it's there. Sometimes the, this can completely go away because there's no hydrogens on that peak at all. And that's that peak right here that's part of the alkene. And then these are the only two peaks with two hydrogens on them, and we can see those as well, okay? So that's just a cool experiment that we can do with NMR as well. Uh, and it only works with carbon NMR, but it helps identify where some of those hydrogens are. All right, questions about carbon NMR. Remember, we only need two things with carbon NMR, relative position and number of unique peaks. Okay. So I wanna introduce the topic of mass spectrometry. In IR, we talked about the strength of individual bonds. In carbon, in proton NMR, we talked about connectivity of where hydrogens were next to other hydrogens. 
And in carbon NMR, we're looking at shift and number of new carbons. However, in mass spectrometry, all we care about is the actual molecular weight of the compound. But because during the experiment, we're starting to give it a high energy, it starts to break apart. And when it breaks apart, it fragments in a certain pattern. And I'll show you a couple of those different patterns to pay attention to. So in mass spectrometry, we have four things we want to consider, okay? The first is the molecular ion peak. It's generally the highest molecular weight peak you see on your spectrum. The second thing we see is the base peak. The base peak is actually the tallest peak, okay? And we usually give it the relative abundance of 100%. The molecular peak is rarely the base peak. The base peak is the most stable fragment that breaks off from the molecular ion peak. Then we have the relative abundance of each of the fragments and that can give us some information. And then the fragmentation pattern, okay. So what does a mass spectrum look like? Well, it's kind of like this. On the x-axis, we have molecular weight. And notice it uh, says M slash Z. That means the molecular weight per charge. So most of the times these have a single charge species in the material, and then you have that's why you have that. So our, our molecular weight here, our molecular ion peak is the peak way up here, okay? The base peak is our tallest peak. So again, this is our tallest peak and that's our molecular ion peak. But we see some other fragmentation patterns here, okay? So the first thing we wanna look at from this here is what's this peak? That seems to be bigger than our molecular ion peak, okay? Well, the structure of our material is ethanol. So this peak right here is ethanol, and this is uh, different. This is clipping off a hydrogen off of your alcohol and giving you this peak here. And this peak here is uh, a difference of 16, going from 45 to 31. So this 47 to here is an oxygen and a hydrogen, it's a total of 17. So that big jump tells you the first thing that clips off is that OH, okay? And this peak is this, the ethyl group by itself, okay? So you start to see that. <clears throat> okay, so when you analyze a mass spectrum, you want to, number one, identify the molecular ion peak. It's usually the highest mass peak. You want to consider the possible formulas for that mass. So if you have a molecular weight of, of 45, you're not looking for a C10 uh, material. You cannot get that many carbons in that low molecular weight. So you want to just consider the formulas that are possible. So for example, something in the 45 range, it would be three carbons and something else, maybe uh, two carbons and something else, maybe one carbon and a and a halogen, you know, so you start looking for things like that. Identify the major peaks because the major peaks are going to tell you molecular weights of things that you might see. And then you also calculate the mass loss between the ion peaks and the fragments. And that tells you what's cut, being cut off. So let's do that as an example here. <clears throat> Let me show you how that can be done. So our molecular ion peak is this one way up here right here, and it's telling us that our molecular weight is 220, 122, okay? So that means we can have only a molecular, uh, uh, an empirical formula that will add up to 122. Okay. Now, I'm gonna tell you that it's this compound here so we can look at different fragments coming off. So we look at our base peak right here, which is our next peak down here, and we see it has a mass of 108 or 107, okay? So that means we've lost a certain amount of mass, okay? In this case, we've lost a total of uh, 15, okay? And it turns out that a methyl group weighs 15 grams per mole. And so that is just the clipping off of this methyl group here gives us our, base peak, our main fragment. 
And then if we clip off CO from this unit here, that's the next fragment we see. And if we clip off CO and two H's, that's the next fragment we see. And then we have this as another major fragment. So this is if you clipped it off here. No, if you clipped it off here, it gives you something like, no, yeah, you clipped it off there. So you have two carbons and an oxygen on it. So that's one of the other fragments that can be. So the key here is to look what the difference in molecular weights between the different peaks gives you an idea of what fragments are breaking off. Now there are some very common fragments we're gonna see. Okay, and the two most common fragments we see are uh, for the um, cleavage of carbonyl compounds to give off a carbonyl and a methyl group. So you're gonna end up technically with a C triple bond O methyl group. That's a really common fragment. Anytime you have a methyl ketone or a, uh, or a simple ester, we're gonna break this bond and give you this simple fragment here. The other fragment you're gonna see a lot is giving off a <clears throat> unit in, because of the five, uh, six member ring you get in the McCafferty. If you have a carbonyl compound, you're gonna split it off to give you two alkenes and you'll be able to see the peaks. And not only that, you'll be able to see what this R group is because whatever fragment this weighs, it'll tell you what it is. Okay, so those are just a couple of examples of weird fragmentation patterns that you can see time and time again. And if you go through the homework, it'll have a couple different examples of these. Okay. So again, I'm just introducing the topic of mass spectrometry so we can ask a question or two on it on the exam. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> notice that my ass on all of the system we had before was just. Um, you know, whole numbers, 45, 50, 75. Okay, that's because we have different isotopic ratios of different elements. So we can have, we have like three different uh, isotopes of hydrogen, hydrogen one, hydrogen two, hydrogen three. And if we take into account the average of the natural abundance of those, we get the average molecular weight of those isotopes. And if we take those out to four decimal places like this, we can then do an experiment called high resolution mass spectrometry, where you get four places after the decimal. Now, knowing what these average masses are for all the different isotope blends, you can now get an exact uh, empirical formula from that exact molecular weight. And this is called high resolution mass spectrometry. So you can actually say, oh, I got, you know, 172.3475. That correlates to five carbons, three hydrogens, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. I don't know if that's true, but that's, you can get that exact um, uh, calculation of your um, empirical formula using that high resolution mass spectrometry. So it's a really powerful tool. <coughs> okay, so again, Introduction to mass spectrometry, just so you know, it's another useful tool in helping identify organic compounds. Questions on NMR or uh, mass spec? Okay, while you're thinking about those questions on NMR and mass spec, I'm going to move to our next chapter, radicals. Okay, so this is module 10. We introduced radicals in module eight when we were talking about the anti or the, yeah, the uh, anti Markovnikov's addition of HBr onto an alkene. The only reason we got the anti Markovnikov's addition on the alkene was the, um, let's see, was the, change in mechanism. We change the mechanism from a cation mechanism to a radical mechanism. So let's do a little bit deeper dive into what radical reactions are and how to use them. <clears throat> so a free radical is any atom or group of atoms that has an unpaired electron, okay? That unpaired electron is reactive and is a high, fairly high energy state, a very energetic thing. And so that we can have them on 
uh, oxygen, carbons, or bromines. Okay. Notice it's not about nucleophilicity. It's about an unpaired electron. Okay. So when we have an unpaired electron on carbon, okay, it's actually occupying an unhybridized p orbital, just like in the case of the carbocation, except in the carbocation, they're both lobes of that p orbital empty. In the case of a free radical, there is a one electron in that unhybridized p orbital. And depending on which part of the orbital is, it's going to bend down the other substituents because it has charge and has electron-electron repulsion. And so it has electron-electron repulsion. Okay. Okay. So that is a little bit different than the carbanion, which is also an unhybridized p orbital, but it has two electrons in it and it's pushing them down even more. Okay. So the key here is that a radical is sp2 hybridized, but it's not exactly planar, not uh, entirely planar like the carbocation. Okay. So that being said, we should have a stability trend that's similar to that of carbocations. Okay. But let's talk about how we generate these. Up to now, most of the reactions we were doing, we have two electrons leave with a more electronegative atom. In the case of radical formations, we typically have a nonpolar bond and we cleave it such that a one of the electrons from the sigma goes with one species and one of the electrons from the sigma bond goes with the other species. This is really common when we have nonpolar bonds between the same atom because neither one's more electronegative than the other. The homo homolysis or breaking apart equally is going to be very common. Okay. And we have an energy associated with this, okay? To break a bond, you need to put energy into that bond to break it into those two radicals, which are that high energy state, okay? So the energy it takes to break a hydrogen-hydrogen bond or a bond association energy is 436 kilojoules per mole, which is pretty high. But to break the chlorine-chlorine bond, it's actually lower at 243. So the idea here is that the bond strength and radical stability are going to be correlated. The harder it is to break those bonds, the more higher energy state it's going to be, the more reactive they're going to be, okay? Now, when the bond association is positive, that means you're forming a bond, okay? And when it's negative, you're breaking a bond, okay? So that's important. Why is it negative for breaking the bond? Well, because you're putting energy into the system to break that bond and you get that energy back when you form that bond. Now, don't, don't get too far down the road here. When we talk about whether the reaction's gonna progress or not, we actually need to end up with a negative enthalpy. We need to give off heat. So to figure out whether the reaction's gonna go, we have to look at the things we're starting with and then the final, product state, okay? It can go through any pathway it wants, but you're looking at the energy at the beginning and the energy at the end. And that's gonna tell you whether the reaction's gonna go or not. So we have to add up all of the breaking of the bonds from the reactants and subtract from that all of the energy of making those new bonds, okay? So if we go to a table, it'll say the bond association energy of hydrogen is 436 kilojoules per mole, okay? And the bond break, the bond dissociation energy of chlorine is gonna be 243, okay? So if those are our reactants and they're gonna break and then form these two new products right here, two equivalents of HCl, that means that our product is going to be giving off 432 kilogram, kilojoules of energy, but we're doing it twice, so we have to multiply it by two. So the total energy of the system is the reactants, which is the hydrogen and the chlorine, giving us a total of this much energy in to break those bonds. And if we look at the products, it's two times this energy because that's the energy that we're releasing to make those bonds. And we make it negative, okay? Because we're giving off that energy. So the net result of our enthalpy of our reaction is 
the start the reagents, the starting materials, minus the strong dissociation energy of all of the products means that we have negative 183, oops, is it showing up on the screen? No, okay. Negative 185 kilojoules per mole to form those two moles of HCM. Okay. Now, what does that negative mean? That negative means it released heat to make this reaction. It released 185 kilojoules of energy to do this. Okay. So if it's releasing heat, that means it's now the products are at a lower energy state than the starting materials, and it's a spontaneous reaction. The reaction does move forward, okay? So we can actually do those calculations <clears throat> on just the starting materials and the products. You don't care about all the intermediate steps, okay? Because it's a thermodynamic reaction, all that matters is not its path. The path can take any way it's want. It's just what you start with and what you end with. What is the energy you're starting with? What is the energy you're ending with? And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about whether the reaction is gonna go or not. If the reaction is exothermic, it will go spontaneously. If the reaction is endothermic, it will not go, okay? And we'll see that in a couple of the reactions we're gonna do in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so why? Well, to break the bond, we had to put energy into the system, right? So we had to break that bond and we created a higher energy material, the radical, okay? So in the case of that, our radical here is less stable than the chlorine-chlorine bond was, <clears throat> okay? Now, if we have two things that are less stable, a radical and a radical, and they combine to form a sigma bond, which is more stable, the product of that reaction <clears throat> is gonna be lower in energy. Excuse me. Okay, and that means that our delta H is gonna be negative because we're giving off heat. We're lo losing energy from that high energy state to our new bond, our lower energy state. Okay. All right, does that make sense? Okay. See, whenever we look at our reaction coordinate diagram, we always think of that intermediate as our higher energy state and our product looking at where that ended up as well. Okay, <clears throat> so if we take this reaction where we're gonna chlorinate uh, methane, we need to look at all the different bond association energies associated with those different bonds, okay? So if we look at the chlorine-chlorine bond, it has a bond association energy here, but we're gonna to have to use that as a starting material because we're starting with that and we're ending with a chloromethyl group here and HCl. Okay. So that these two energies are going to be our energy input to the system. And let me box that in blue here, energy input to the system because we're starting with those. And then these are where we're gonna end up with. So this is the energy output. So our starting materials are our bonds broken, which are these whoa, right here. And that's going to be the 230, 243 plus the 436, which is this one right here. I'm sorry, 39 minus the energy of the bonds we formed, which is the 350 and the four. And when we do that math, we see that the reaction is negative by 99 kilojoules, meaning it's exothermic and it will go forward. It will be uh, make product from this reaction. Okay. If this number is positive, that makes the reaction endothermic and the reaction is not favored. In fact, if you just run the reaction and it's supposed to be endothermic, your, your product yield is gonna be very, very low, if any at all. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now we have radicals and we saw that breaking a bond takes it into a higher energy state, but not all radicals are the same. We have the radical stability of the materials is based on the type of radical it is. Primary radicals are less stable than um, secondary radicals and secondary radicals are less stable than tertiary radicals. Uh, I have a question here. So if the reaction is endothermic, are you just creating radical products or 
will the reaction not proceed at all? If you made radicals, they're they, when they are going, they're going to end up making the starting materials back at the end of the reaction. So it's just not going to go forward. You might make a little bit, you might somehow dump in some, enough heat to make it work for a little bit, but it's not favored at all. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> there's a difference in energy between the primary and the secondary radical. So what we're gonna see here is why, okay? So <clears throat> it takes more energy to form the primary radical than the secondary radical because their bond associations are slightly different. Now their bond associations are different because of the idea that our secondary and tertiary radicals can have hyperconjugation. Our adjacent hydrogens can help stabilize the radical and keep it in uh, that higher energy state with less energy needed, okay? So stability of radicals is a thermodynamic product, not a kinetic product. So it's all about the energy you put into the system, not the speed at which it forms. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a big table on bond association. Okay. So radical stability is the same as carbocation stability. Tertiary is more stable than secondary, more stable than primary. Okay. But are there trends associated with the bond association energies? Turns out the trends in bond association energies are very similar to those of the acid-base reactions we looked at, okay? They trend the same way, okay? So the first trend is decreasing electronegativity decreases bond strength, okay? So what that means is the bigger the difference, okay, in electronegativity between the two atoms in the bond, the bigger the difference, the stronger the bond it has, okay? So that means our carbon fluorine bond is gonna be our strongest bond uh, between chlorine, between a halogen and carbon or anything on that top row and carbon because it has the highest electronegativity difference. If we move over one, we're now at oxygen and that's a weaker bond between carbon and oxygen. We move over one, that's nitrogen and that's a weaker bond between nitrogen and carbon. Notice they're decreasing electronegativity as we go. <coughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> the same works for hydrogen. The bigger the difference in electronegativity between the hydrogen and the, and the other atom, the stronger the bond, okay? So if we look at oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, therefore the carbon-hydrogen bond <clears throat> is not as strong as the hydrogen-oxygen bond, okay? So think about it, the larger the difference in electronegativity, the covalent bond is more polar, is stronger, and it's shorter, okay? So that trend follows the same as acids and bases. The next thing is <clears throat> decreased electron, decreasing electronegativity and the size of the, um, and the increase in size decrease the strength. So as we move further away from fluorine on the table, it gets weaker. And as we move down the table, or as we get larger, the bonds get longer and weaker, okay? So think shorter bonds are stronger and have a higher bond association energy. Longer bonds are weaker and have a lower bond association. <clears throat> Just like in, in acids and bases, the hybridization on carbon changes. Okay, so the uh, hybridization on carbon changes because of S character, which means that <clears throat> our SP hybridized carbons are stronger than our SP2 hybridized car carbon that are stronger than our SP hybridized carbons. Okay, so we saw that with acidity too, that SP hydrogen was more acidic the sp2 was less acidic and the sp was the least acidic, okay? So it follows that same trend. Bond association also increases hyperconjugation uh, with hyperconjugation, which means that a hydrogen next on a carbon with three carbons to it has the lowest bond association energy because it can stabilize that radical. 
So a secondary is less stable than a primary, which is less stable than a methyl. And therefore, their bond associations increase as you get to less and less substituted carbons. Okay. So think about it in that respect. You know, it's the hardest to make the carbocation in a methyl group. It's easiest to make it in a tertiary uh, carbon. And therefore, the, the bond association energy of that hydrogen is higher. I'm sorry, the bond association energy is lower in that because it's easier to form. Okay, <clears throat> so and I said this before, but the whole reason that carbocations are more stable is because of this hyperconjugation with the sigma bond of the hydrogen on adjacent carbons. And when you have three of them, you have a total of three hyper, hyperconjugations. In a methyl group, you only have one. In a secondary, you only have two. But in that tertiary, you have three of them. Okay, That gives rise to the stability in carbocations. It also gives rise to its stability in radicals. Because <clears throat> remember, that radical is in an in the, is in that unhybridized p orbital, just like the carbocation. Okay, so the next thing that helps us is resonance. <clears throat> Anytime you can spread a charge or a radical out over more atoms, the more easy it is to form, okay? So in the case of our tertiary, um, hey, uh, if we just think about our tertiary, it's gonna be harder to make that than an allylic because in the case of the allylic, which is where you have a, hmm, oh yeah, okay. So you have a double bond next to carbon you're making your radical on. Well, that radical does, doesn't stay there. We have a resonance structure that lets that radical go back and forth between two carbons, okay? In the tertiary, that radical stays on one carbon. If we can spread it out over two carbons, then it means it's more stable and easier to form. So it has a lower bond association energy. Now look, let's look at the benzylic. When we have a radical on the outside of the, the um, benzene ring, we can, by resonance, put it in three different positions on the ring, giving us a total of four places to put that radical. And so that makes it even more stable. Notice this is the same as this over here. So we have four different positions we can put that radical. Therefore, it's more stable. Therefore, it's easier to break that bond. It has a lower bond association energy. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's the last one. Yeah. Okay. Now, that works for functional groups. It doesn't have to be an electronic drawing group or an electron donating group. If you have a carbocation, you wanted electron donating groups to help stabilize that positive charge. In the case of a radical, you don't have a charge. So all you care about is conjugation. So you can do conjugation with or with, with electronic drawing groups or electron donating groups. So let's look at the cyano group right here that we would call electron drawing group right here. Because we can draw a resonance structure where the radical is on the carbon or the radical is on the nitrogen, that makes this more stable uh, to the, uh, makes it more stable because your radical spread over two different atoms. Therefore, it has a lower bond association energy. You can also do that with carbonyls because you can put that radical on the oxygen. It's on two atoms. It has a lower bond association energy. In the case of oxygen, you have a lone pair here. One of those electrons can move so that you can actually have it spread out over two atoms. And in the case of nitrogen, you also have a lone pair, which can do the same thing. So notice two of them are electron donating groups because they have lone pairs. Two of them are technically electronic electron groups, but it doesn't matter because of resonance, it's the st radical stability is increased. All right, questions on the trends in radical stability. Those should look very familiar with the same way we did acidity and other things. They follow just the same trends. Okay, well, because of that, because of these differences in conjugation and stuff like that, we can actually form stable radicals. You can put those radicals in a bottle and they stay there, okay? So, but they have some very common threads to them. Number one, they can delocalize or 
they have sterically hindered centers, so it protects the radical. Okay, so in the case of this, we have these big bulky groups, but then the radical can also be rotated around that ring. Okay, so those are helping stabilize by resonance and by sterics. In the case of tempo, we can't go around a ring, but we can put the radical on the nitrogen or the oxygen. And so, but we have the steric groups keeping it safe. Here, we can go around the ring or up to this nitrogen and we have steric groups. The cool thing about this one is we have the radical on this side. Through conjugation, we can move the radical over to this side here. And so that radical can be going all the way across two different rings, help stabilize it. Plus it has, oops, a big bulky group to keep it from reacting. Okay. So not only can we form radicals by just looking at the bond dissociation energy, not only is there a trend for stability of these based on, the, on their ability to uh, stabilize that uh, radical, but we can take advantage of resonance and steric hindrance to make stable radicals. Okay, all right. So in all radical uh, reactions, we tend to have a system where we have three steps in our radical reaction. We have the initiation step, which is the formation of the radical. Then we have the propagation step where we do a bunch of other radical reactions. And then we have a termination step where we lose our radicals. So let's talk about creating that first radical that we want. Okay. The best way to create our first radical is to break a weak bond. Okay. And something that has a very low bond dissociation energy, right? So if we think about that, we want to actually encourage it to break homolytically. So you would like to have it between two of the same atoms. One of the most common radical initiators we have are called peroxides. That's where you have an oxygen oxygen bond. Okay. In the case of this first one here, we have T butyl peroxide. And when it is heated, to a little over 100 degrees, notice it's bond dissociation energy here, it forms two oxygen radicals, okay? And we can heat it or we can hit it with light, either one will do it. But either way, both oxygens leave with one of those electrons from that sigma bond, okay? Another very common one is to use dibenzyl peroxide. However, it goes through a second step. It has a much lower bond dissociation energy, which means it happens at a lower temperature, it forms our oxygen radical first, but then through a rearrangement reaction, it kicks out CO2 and ends up with this phenyl radical. Okay, so that's the actual radical species that is doing any kind of attacking and you actually give off CO2 from the reaction. So do we see why we use radical initiators, specifically things with very weak bonds and very small bond association energies? It takes less heat and or less energy of light to make that first radical step. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so now that we have a way to initiate radicals at a low temperature or under um, those conditions, let's talk about all three steps that happen in any radical reaction, okay? And we're gonna talk about it with the, uh, the looking at the free radical chlorination of methane. Now, if you think about it, the carbon-hydrogen bond is not very polar. We can't hit it with a nucleophile. The only thing we can do is maybe extract it with a base uh, and, and, or something like that. You know, it's, it's a very difficult substrate to work with. However, in the radical conditions, we can uh, partially or fully chlorinate methyl at a very, fairly low temperature. Okay. So let's talk about the different steps necessary to do uh, this kind of chlorination in a free radical form. So the first thing we need to do is we need to generate our uh, radical. And it turns out chlorine has a fairly low uh, or an intermediate bond dissociation energy around 400, about, sorry, 243, which means we can heat it or with light, break it apart into two chlorine radicals, okay? So <clears throat> we don't really need to form very much of this because of a propagation step. Um, let's see. So lower bond association energies and weaker bonds promote radical, yes. If you put radical reactions there, yes. 
especially weak bonds between two of the exact same atom, because then you don't have nucleophilicity trying to make an anion cation. You have two things walking away at the exact same amount, which is a, a right. So it's, you'll see this a lot with the um, initiators are always the same atoms. Okay, so once we initiate this, once we get a little bit of radical in there, we then go to the next step, which is the propagation step. This is why we don't need very much of that radical to start, okay? Because during propagation, your starting material has a radical on it, your product has a radical on it. Because we're breaking a sigma bond and only one of those electrons is forming that new sigma bond. So that means every product has a radical. And if every product has a radical, that can act as the radical in the next step of the reaction. Okay, so let's look at this first one. So we generate a little bit of this, of the chlorine radical, and it reacts with a just one molecule of methane. When it does, it takes a hydrogen off of the methane and creates a new sigma bond because they each have one electron donated to make that sigma bond. We leave one electron on that carbon. Okay. Now, the bond association energy for that hydrogen on that carbon is something like 480. So it's not gonna happen first. So we're using that lower bond, uh, uh, bond association energy of the chlorine to get our first radical, okay? But it does then produce this radical. Now, this radical that can then react with another equivalent of chlorine, neutral chlorine, and create a chlorine radical and a new chlorine carbon bond. That new chlorine radical can then react with another hydrogen. It can be on the same methyl group or it can be on a different one to give you a new one or more equivalent of HCl and another radical, which then reacts with chlorine to make another chlorine radical and a chlorine carbon bond, which then reacts with another chlorine radical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> okay, so. This can happen any number of times, any number of ways. It can continue to continue to go until you run out of things that can uh, do this, like you run out of chlorine or you run out of uh, hydrogens on carbon. At that point, the reaction is said to terminate, okay? So notice, no matter what we did here in this propagation step, we always created a radical, okay? Which means in the termination step, what we're gonna do is we're going to have two radicals form a sigma bond, okay? So in this reaction, we could have had a chlorine react with a chlorine to create a chlorine chlorine bond. That's a chlorine here, sorry. <coughs> that stops that, uh, how, that radical from reacting. Now, doesn't mean another radical can't come and initiate it again, but that again stops the radical reaction. We can also have the last chlorine radical react with the last carbon radical, and that creates a neutral product. So that terminates the radical chain, okay? Or we could have a carbon radical react with a carbon radical to create a neutral sigma bond, a non-radical product, and that also terminates the reaction, okay? So the three steps in our reaction are, number one, initiate our first radical with something with a low bond association energy. The second step is every time you react a radical with a neutral species, it creates another radical that can then react with another neutral species to create another radical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you run out of things to react with, and then you can have radical, radical coupling, and that terminates the reaction. All right, does everybody understand those three steps in radical reactions? Okay, so now let's talk about selectivity and reactivity. We talked about how in our other reactions, you know, we know exactly where something's going to happen because we have a leaving group and we have a nucleophile and so we have that. In the chances in uh, radical reactions, we can react any of those um, carbon hydrogen bonds with a radical. Okay, so there should be some kind of rule about this, right? So let's talk about just these reactions here. If we have this propane, okay, we have a total of 
three hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, and three hydrogens here, okay? So we have a total of eight hydrogens that can go. We have two of them that are a secondary and six of them that are primary, okay? So statistically, two of the eight sites to react would be the secondaries, which is 25%. And six of the eight sites to react would be those methyl groups, those primaries, which would be about 75%, okay? So just a random statistics of whatever they have tells us that's not gonna happen. I mean, that we're gonna have 25 and 75%, okay? <clears throat> However, I said, secondary radicals are more stable than primary radicals, okay? So that means if we wait around for the most stable radical, we should have more reactions on the secondary site than on the primary site, okay? So if we can wait around, that means we're being very selective about where we're going to react, okay? And so we're waiting for the more stable, thermodynamically stable radical to form. Okay, we see that when we have bromine here. We actually get greater than statistical amounts of the secondary because of its reactivity. It waits for the more thermodynamic product and we get more of the secondary substitution. In the case of chlorine, we get more than the statistical product of the more substituted. So again, it's more reactive because it is not as selective as the bromine was, but it's still waiting for the more thermodynamic product. Only fluorine is so reactive that it's approaching the statistical uh, distribution, okay? So fluorine is so reactive, there is no selectivity at all. It's gonna react at the first hydrogen it reacts with and we get very close to the statistical number for the, just the number of hydrogen it has. Okay. So let's dig into that a little deeper. <coughs> okay. So if we look at the bond association energy for fluorine, bromine, and chlorine, we see the bond association energy of fluorine is really low, 159. Chlorine and bromine are of higher and iodines just a little bit lower. Okay. So if we look at the different possible propagation steps, we'll see that when it reacts, we're gonna have that product ratio of either forming it on the primary side or on the secondary side. To form it on the secondary side, we had to form that secondary radical and that secondary radical then had to react with something else. So, so there must be something driving this, right? So, Let's think about that. Let's calculate out what the energies would be just to see why this product ratio might be going that way. So if we look at just the calculating out the bond association energies for making the primary halide for all these, the breaking of a primary carbon hydrogen bond is 422 kcals per mole. The breaking of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are a little different. And then if we look at the bond formation, the bond formation of the, the acid right here is very high. Notice these are very high. So we get a lot of energy of it just creating the byproduct of the, carb of the acid and the bond of the carbon to the halogen bonds are also much higher than that of the halogens to themselves, right? With fluorine being the highest, chlorine being second highest, bromine being the, high, the third, and iodine being the weakest. Okay. So now, if we took the uh, total bond dissociation energy of the starting materials and subtracted it from the total starting, uh, the total uh, uh, bond dissociation energies of the products and we did the math, we'd end up with fluorine being a exothermic by 464 kilojoules per mole, okay? That's really high, that's a lot of exotherm, that's a very energetic reaction. Chlorine is much lower at 118, bromine's much lower at negative 48, so it gives off 48 kilojoules per mole of energy. But look at iodine, it's positive positive 39. 
So what does that tell us about the reaction with iodine? It's not favored. We get very little product from that reaction because it's endothermic. Okay. So we see that the fluorine reaction is very exothermic. So it's probably gonna be the most energetic reaction followed by the chlorine, followed by the bromine. Okay. That amount of heat given off is decreasing the selectivity of that reaction. Okay. Now let's calculate that for the secondary uh, abstraction of that hydrogen here. It's a slightly lower bond energy right here, but and it's slightly different energies in the bonds that they formed here. But if we do the math, we see the fluorine is again, the most energetic. Uh, the chlorine and the bromine are still energetic, but not as, and the iodine is again, positive. So the iodine is not favored. Okay, so why? Okay, question. Um, so the more heat is given off the reaction, it makes it more favorable and it makes it less selective. It's gonna react as many sites as possible because it doesn't care. It's getting a lot of energy out of the reaction no matter where it went. Okay. So the first thing we note is that the fluorine reaction is very exothermic and the iodine reaction is actually endothermic. And it has to do with the idea that the iodine radical is actually stable and it, there's no driving force for it to go and extract the one from the hydrogen. So that's the big difference between the fluorine and the iodine. Oh, two minutes, okay. All right, we also noticed that it was slightly more exothermic to extract the primary uh, hydrogen than the secondary hydrogen, okay? And therefore, even though that it was doing that, it was still giving us an exothermic reaction until we got to the bromine radical. Trying to extract the hydrogen with the bromine radical was actually endothermic for the primary Okay, so because it was less energetic to abstract it from the primary, it prefers the secondary and we have a higher selectivity of it reacting with the um, secondary. In fact, it, the, the, the one with the secondary is less endothermic, but it's still less endothermic. So, okay, I'm gonna have to stop here because we're at 140. Oh, we went 150 or 140? 150. 150, okay. I have a post-it note on my other computer, which is why. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, what this means is, okay, I can't do it there, all right. We're gonna go back to the Hammond principle. Remember the Hammond principle said that endothermic reactions are the ones that resemble the products more in their transition state. And exothermic reactions are the ones that resemble the starting materials in their transition state, okay? So if a bond is forming, the bond is less than half formed to the transition state in the exothermic form. And if the bond is breaking, the bond is less than half broken in that transition state, okay? So that tells you something about where it is on its energy scale and how far it is along on the reaction coordinate diagram, okay? The transition for the endothermic is the other half. The bond is actually more half formed in that endothermic reaction and the bond breaking is more than half broken. Okay. So what does that mean? Okay, so if we looked at the difference between in the fluorine of abstracting that hydrogen from one or the other, what we're gonna see is that get, taking it in, because the bond is more abstracted in the, I'm sorry, because the, um, there is very little difference between the abstraction of the primary and the secondary, there is very little difference in energy found from that. And the transition state is far from the hydrogen. See where our fluorine abstraction is here. It's very far away. This is much more like starting material. Now, in the case of chlorination, it's actually stretched out more. It's further out. So getting from the primary is harder 
because it's forming the less stable radical. We already have a partial radical here. The hydrogen is further away. So now we're caring about whether or not that radical is stable, okay? So the primary is a little harder to make, so it's a little higher in energy here. So we see a bigger difference in the formation of the primary versus secondary, okay? So because we're starting to have that hydrogen pulled away a little bit more, we care about the stability of the radical being formed. When we go to bromine, we actually are almost completely breaking that bond before we have it. So it's really late in the transition. We've almost completely broken that bond during that hydrogen abstraction, meaning that we have to care about what stability, what the stability of our intermediate here is, because this bond is forming more later in there because it has a less strong bond association or a lower bond association than that of the fluorine. So it happens later in the experiment. Therefore, the primary is much higher in energy in, than the secondary and the secondary is favored. Okay, and then of course the iodine has uh, no there. Because the bromine has that stronger, that later in the reaction sequence bond formation, it cares whether or not there's a primary or a secondary radical formed. If it cares whether there's a primary or secondary radical form, it will favor the secondary radical because it's more stable. And therefore we get selectivity right here. We have a lower reactivity, but a higher selectivity. Because chlorine was kind of intermediate between bromine and fluorine as where it is in the transition state, it is not as selective as bromine, uh, but it is more reactive than bromine. So we see a little bit, um, almost 50-50 between the primary and the secondary, okay? However, in the fluorine, <clears throat> we approach an almost statistical variant because it's so early in the transition state, we're not forming a partial radical. It can take either one equally because the two bond energies that come out are approximately the same. Okay, so because it doesn't care whether it's a primary, secondary, or tertiary, because it's not late in the transition state, it's early in the transition state where we're not even forming a partial radical, it can take any of them based on statistically how many possible uh, uh, hydrogens there were there. If there was primary, secondary, and tertiary, you would have a statistical value of all of them. There would be very little difference between the statistical value and the thermodynamic, but then the actual final product, okay? And it all has to do with where it is in that particular transition state. If you're not forming a radical, you have no selectivity at all. If you're starting to partially form a radical, you start getting some selectivity. If you're late in that transition state and almost completely forming the radical before the abstraction is done, then it's all about the radical stability. Okay, <clears throat> so there turns out to be a relative selectivity in the hydro uh, hydrogenation reactions based on whether you have a primary, secondary, or tertiary reaction, okay? And it's all about that reactivity, that transition state, okay? So if we did relative number that a primary was one, and for fluorine, if we had primary is one, we have about a 1.1, so it's a little bit higher to have it secondary and a 1.4 for tertiary, okay? So there's very little difference between those. You're probably gonna see an equal mix of all of them based on the number of those different hydrogen types you have, okay? Chlorine, however, there's a little bit bigger difference. It goes from one to four to five, meaning you're, start, you're starting to see more of the secondary and tertiaries happen in comparison with your primary. But let's look at bromine. In bromine, you start at one, you go to 82. That's almost two orders of magnitude to 1600, okay? Okay, I have a question. Uh, so wait, in the case where we would not be considering the stability of the radical produced, the earlier it is in the transition state or the more reactive it is, 
the less it cares whether you're forming a primary, secondary, or tertiary. The later in the reaction state, the more it cares, and therefore you have more selectivity and you see a bigger difference in the relative uh, reaction rates of the different types. Okay. So if you have to, if you're, if you're, have a lower enough reactivity that you wait for the, the, the tertiary to form, or to wait for the radical to form, it will preferentially form the tertiary because it's the most stable. Does that make more sense? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so when we talk about these relative selectivities of halogenations, we can predict our products based on the number of hydrogens available of each hydrogen type, okay? So we have to take out the number we have and so that'll give us the total time of the, of the total number of reactions and we can predict our product ratio. So let's do that real quick in our last three minutes here. Okay, so we have to think of the number of different hydrogens we have available to us of the different types. So in this chlorination, we have um, one, two, three methyl groups. Those are all methyl. And so they're all primaries. And so we have nine primary hydrogens and we have one tertiary hydrogen. Okay, so that means that we have uh, one of the um, ones that's tertiary. So that means we have one hydrogen times the relative reactive ratio of four, and we have nine hydrogens at a relative reactivity ratio of one. Okay, so if we add our nine times one, we get nine, and our one times 5.5, we get uh, 5.1 which is a total of 14, okay? Which means of those 14.1 reactions that are gonna happen, nine of them are gonna happen on that primary, but 5.1 of them are going to happen on that tertiary, which gives our product ratio of 64% of the primary and 36% on the tertiary, okay? We only have one hydrogen on the tertiary, but it's 5.1 times lot more a reactive than the primaries. Therefore, we get more of it in the product ratio. If we look at it for bromine, the numbers even get different, okay? We only have one prime uh, of the, um, I'm sorry, we have nine of those of with a reactivity ratio of one, okay? So we have nine of those with the reactivity ratio of one, okay? So there's, oh, we only have one of them that's tertiary, but its reactivity ratio is 1600, okay? So that gives us 1,609 reactions possible happening, okay? So if we divide nine by the 1,609, we get 0 0.6%. If we divide 1,600 by 16.9, we get 99.4%, which means our product ratio is gonna be less than 1% on the primary, even though there's nine times more hydrogens to do it, this site, the tertiary site is 1600 times faster. So it is going to be the dominant product in the system. Okay. All right. So relative selectivity can help you predict product ratio. You need just, just multiply the relative um, pro, uh, the reactive rate, reactivity ratio times the number of hydrogens you have divided by the total number of reactions possible and that gives you your predicted product yields. All right, we're right here at 150. I'm sorry I got delayed there with that, um, that call from the lab. We'll pick up with stereochemistry of halogenation and then we're going to end up doing chapter 11 uh, on Monday as well. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop recording, stay behind if you need, if you wanna ask questions.